at this time. Um, so the recording from Friday did not get something happened with the with the record button. It got corrupted or something. So I don't have the recording from last Friday. Um, so I tried to upload that right afterwards. I apologize. Um, for the most part, it was practice with stoichiometry that we went over, right? And then we went into that the uh, quiz. So on the quiz. So good question. Let me let me log into Canvas real quick. And yes, I did not put any of the, the answers in for, uh, I did not put the answers in for the stoichiometry problem on the quiz. So if you submitted your work on the quiz, um, we'll check your answer by going through the problem beginning of class today. And then I'll go through and I'll grade everybody's quizzes um, later this afternoon to get to give the scores for it. Um, so are going to want to go ahead and turn that in though. Uh, but yeah, if you go to take the quiz, there's a file upload button right there in the quiz. Uh, no, sorry, I landed on making it just part of the quiz, and but I didn't get that on the recording because I didn't get the recording saved, so apologies. Uh, if you didn't get it turned in yet, just get it turned in, um, and we'll go from there. Again, I have the hardest time finding the mouse on this angle. All right. So first off, how did how did that stoichiometry problem go? It's kind of a it's a bit of a bear remembering what all the different terms mean and keeping track of the logic, right? But for the most part, it's it's pretty simple steps. It's figure out what runs out first, figure out what's left over, figure out how much you can make use all of your living reactants and then figure out your um, what percentage did you actually make all right so where should we start in this case start by balancing good yeah correct okay. yes that's a good question I put the 1.42 grams underneath the silver because we're, I was asking about the silver concentrations, not um, the zinc oxides. Zinc oxides, that's the white, the uh, old school white sunscreen that lifeguards have put on their nose is zinc oxide. It's also the byproduct if you use silver polish on um, tarnished silver. Um, although also the other, another major source of silver tarnishing is actually silver. Um, sulfur, so you would actually have silver sulfide and make zinc sulfide, but similar process, right? All right, so we start by balancing. What do we have to do to balance? Is there a bad place to start, good place to start? Pick something and go with it. When in doubt, start on the left, pick something. Our zinc looks good, right? So you have AG2 and one oxygen, so have one oxygen on, the, on both sides, so oxygens are good. So all we need is a two in front of the silver, right? Okay, so zinc plus AG2O, silver oxide. Do we need to say as a uh, Roman numeral for silver oxide? If we were naming it. Why not? That's okay. Because silver is one of our exceptions in the transition metal, right? There's those six right next to each other. Aluminum, gallium, indium are always plus three. Zinc and cadmium are always plus two. Silver is always plus one when they're ions. What's the next thing we're going to want to do? Moles. Let's just put everything in moles. We don't have to put the silver, our actual yield in moles, but if we're gonna have to do a percent yield at the end anyway, we're either gonna have to put our theoretical yield into grams so we can compare it with the actual yield, or we could put our actual yield into moles and we can do our percent yield that way. But one way or the other, you have to do the same math. It doesn't really matter which 
which order you do it in. So let's just put everything in moles. So zinc is easy, right? And silver is easy. We just go to the periodic table. We already have their um, uh, molecular masses since they're just a elemental solids. So how many moles do we get for zinc? How many sig figs do we want to keep? Three? Is that up there, 0.72 grams is only two sig figs, right? So we're only going to keep two sig figs. Our zeros to the left of the first non-zero number don't count as sig figs. So this is right. 0 0.011 moles is right for sig figs. How about for silver oxide? How many moles do we get there? And then 1.42 grams of silver is how many moles? Did anybody do it that way or did everybody leave it in grams? That's, like I said, that's totally reasonable. We just wanted more practice. We could take it to moles, 1.42 grams of silver. And silver is 169. 196. No, gold is 196. Silver is 107. So we're going to get something pretty close to the same as these others, right? 0.00. .00. Six, seven? No. Five something? We can keep three sig figs. No, it's a little bit more than a third, than two thirds. So it should be something like seven. Point zero zero seven. Who's the calculator out? Help me out here. One point one point four two divided by okay. I did oh I did the math the wrong way. Sorry, so say it again. One three one six. We're only gonna keep three sick figs, so I'm going to keep our actual separate from our theoretical so we don't confuse ourselves. So is this one, is limiting reactant very tricky with this one? Why not? It's one to one, right? We're, if it's one to one, we're using everything up at the same rate. So whatever we have less of is going to be our limiting reactant. Because this we're using one mole of zinc for every one mole of silver oxide. So all we have to do is look at these amounts. Whichever one is less is going to be our limiting reactant. So zinc. So to answer that part of the question, in this case, you just from right here, you could just say they're being used up at a one-to-one -one rate. Therefore, zinc is a limiting reactant. You could also show that. Um, one other way we can show the, our um, limiting reactant and theoretical yield at the same time is we can say we can use each of these to figure out how much product we could make. Whichever number is less tells us our limiting reactant, right? That the logic behind that is if you have enough buns to make 17 hamburgers and you have enough patties to make 12 hamburgers, you can only make 12 hamburgers, right? And that in itself tells you what you're running. You're running out of patties first, right? So you can show it that way. So just as we another way of showing your work here, mole of zinc for every one mole of zinc, that's two moles of silver made. Do the same thing with our silver oxide, 0 0.0118 moles of 
Ag2O, and it's the same two to one ratio. One mole Ag2O is two moles silver. So we have enough zinc to make 0 0.1, 0 0.022 moles. And we have enough silver oxide to make 0 0.0236, if I doubled that properly. <laughs> Doubling things in your head is usually not too bad until you have to carry a one, right? So just looking at these, we can say, okay, we have enough zinc to make this much silver. We have enough silver oxide to make this much silver. Therefore, zinc is our limiting reactant. Whichever of these is a the smaller amount is our limiting, tells us our limiting reactant, right? It's a little bit different logic than way we, the way we did it on Friday, but it's getting to the same point either way, right? All right, so label your limiting reactant so we don't forget. Once we know our limiting reactant, pretty much all of our calculations are going to be using the limiting reactant, right? Because this is, it's limiting because this is what's going to control everything else about the reaction, right? And look at that. By doing it this way, we also just figured out our theoretical yield too, didn't we? So if you have to do a complete reaction study where you have to answer all four of these questions, that's one of the better ways to show your limiting reactant. Although in this case, if we have to figure out excess reagent, that, that doesn't really help us that much because we still are going to have to go back and do the same calculation, figure out how much reactant was used as well if it's not one-to-one. -one. Uh, I also just realized um, when I talked about the word reagent, reagent and reactant mean the exact same thing. Reagents is the old school way of saying it, but that's the way I learned it first. So I still slip up and write reagent sometimes. But limiting reactant, limiting reagent, excess reactant, excess reagent, it's literally synonyms. There's no difference between those two words. So don't don't stress about that one. All right. So we figured out our theoretical yield. What's our excess reactant going to be? We know it's going to be the silver oxide. How much of it's going to be left over? Yeah, they're being used at the same rate, right? So we can just say, okay, well, if they're being used at the same rate, we can just say, I have 0 0.0118 moles of Ag2O to start with, and I'm going to use 0 0.011 moles of Ag2O used, we just subtract it. If it's not a one-to-one -one ratio, you just have to do the step, show the step, the stoichiometry step, to say for every two moles of reactant A used, one mole of reactant B is used. What's the sig figs, what are the sig figs gonna do here? Subtraction, right? So we got to keep three sig figs here, only two sig figs here, and only goes to the thousandths place. It only goes to the thousandths place and we're doing subtraction. Where, what does our answer need to go to? Thousandths place. Luckily, we are gonna wind up rounding up so we don't get zero for excess reactant after sig figs. That can happen sometimes. But in this case, we'll wind up with 0 0.01 moles of Ag2O left, or excess. All right, so we answered our limiting reagent. We answered our theoretical yield. We answered our excess reactant. If I don't specify the units, leaving all these in moles is totally fine. It's also 
great if you put them in grams, since we'd actually be measuring them in grams. But if I don't specify, the theoretical yield is this amount in moles. When I'm paying more attention when I write a problem, usually I'll say in grams, um, if I want you to put it in grams. But otherwise, you answered the question just by leaving it in moles. Any questions so far? A lot of steps to remember again, but none of them are individually that tricky, right? So what do we do to answer the last question? Percent yield. Part over whole, right? This was our, our analogy for percent yield was like your grade. Points you could have got or points you did get divided by the points you could have gotten. Right by divided by points possible. Theoretical yield is our points possible. If everything went perfectly and we didn't lose anything, this is how much we could have made. But we never actually get that. So our actual yield is going to be the points you actually got in this analogy. Right, so percent yield. Zero point zero one three two moles over zero point zero two two moles times one hundred. So we'll get what around sixty percent. How many sig figs are we going to keep? Two, so give me two sig figs. 58%? It's gonna be something close to that, right? Just eyeballing these numbers. Can you ever have more than 100% yield? Bingo, good answer. So technically, no, but you can measure more than 100% yield, right? We can never make more than 0 0.022 moles of product, but if we're not careful about how we measured it, or if it's impure, or if we've measured the leftover silver oxide as part of our product when really it's not, there are ways that you can wind up getting a number that makes it look like it's more than 100% yield. That doesn't mean you're magically creating something out of nothing. That just means that you've got some garbage in there. A lot of times it's leftover water. If you didn't dry your product before you weighed it, then you're weighing the weight of the water along with the weight of your product, right? But if you didn't take that into account, it looks like you got too much product. I'd say that partly to cover my own butt because when I write these problems, sometimes I'm I'm estimating arithmetic in my head and I have a tendency sometimes to guess the wrong direction when I'm rounding to make it look like it's a random measurement and I'll give you a number that it's more than 100% yield. That's not necessarily me trying to trick you. Sometimes that's just when I'm writing these problems, I'm doing it quickly and not double checking my work. Um, so apologies. And no, it's not out of the ordinary to actually get a number like that is my justification for that anyway. All right, any other questions on, on the stoichiometry stuff so far? Literally, this is as complicated as it can get unless I make it harder to get to moles somehow. But if I have to make, if I make you do some problem solving to get to how many moles you have of a reactant, that could make it a little bit trickier. But once you get to moles, everything's always the same. All right. Now, when you took chemistry before, did you guys talk about classifying reactions, types of reactions? What types of reactions can you remember, if you remember those sec that? Exothermic, endothermic, combustion, What'd you say? Acid base. Those are all the answers I like to hear. Can it be more than one of those at the same time? Yeah, it can be an exothermic combustion reaction, right? That's 
it would be really weird to have a combustion reaction that wasn't exothermic based on our knowledge of how the world works. Um, it's not impossible. Is it? I don't think, I can't think of a reason why it would be across the board impossible to have a endothermic combustion reaction, but I also can't think of an example where that actually happens. Yeah. I hate to deal in absolutes, right? So I very rarely will say always or never, but probably never, probably never see a combustion reaction. Um, so one of the reasons I ask is because I want to know kind of where everybody's starting from, but also because I want to point out that different books, different textbooks are going to have different ways of classifying reactions, um, which is really, really a pain. And so for instance, this is uh, uh, an OpenStax textbook that I teach Gen Chem with as our types of reactions are synthesis, decomposition, single replacement, and double replacement. Um, that I don't particularly like that classification uh, because there's lots of different ways that you can have a synthesis reaction. Synthesis reactions by this definition just means you took two small pieces and you made one larger piece with them. And decomposition is just the opposite. And a single replacement is like the, the reaction we just did where you swapped, um, swapped the silver and the zinc swapped places. And a double replacement is the same thing twice. I'm showing you this because it's in the textbook. These are common ways of describing what's happening in reactions, but they're not the one we're going to go with. We start looking at other ways of looking at it. A different textbook for Gen Chem students says, well, chemical reactions, there's really four types. There's precipitation, acid base, gas evolution, and redox. Well, I really don't like that one because some gas evolution reactions are redox reactions, and some acid-base reactions are gas evolution reactions. This one I really don't like because it's presented as the, them being mutually exclusive when they're not. Um, another one, and another one, and, and another one. You guys get the point? There's like as many different ways of classifying reactions as there are chemistry textbooks. Every chemistry textbook has its own way of classifying reactions. Um, and different fields of chemistry do it differently. For instance, this one right here is, is for <laughs> organic chemistry. Organic chemistry doesn't look, they talk about oxidation and reduction a little bit, um, but they also talk about substitution reactions and addition reactions and elimination reactions. That's a type of reactions that you wouldn't really discuss unless you were in an OCHEM class. And same for um, biochemistry, biochemistry reactions, you can have, um, they, they're classified usually by um, what type of enzyme it is. You can have oxidoreductases, transferases, hydrolases, ly lysases, isomerases, ligases. There are all going to be different types of reactions as specific to a biochemical system. So what we're going to focus on in this class is okay well what's the most basic way that we can we can sort of create a flow chart of reactions and all chemical reactions when we get down to it are one of two things either reactions transfer between nuclei or they don't so this is our broad way of describing chemical reactions that's going to be our go-to for this class Anybody remember what the reaction type is called where you transfer electrons? Is that sounding familiar? If, if electrons are transferring, what's happening to the atoms? They're becoming ions or they're, or they're becoming neutral or they're changing from one ion to a different ion. But either way, charges are changing, right? Is that ringing any bells for what type of reaction that might be? When something's changing charges, what do you call that? Or for instance, go back to the reaction we've used a bunch before. Iron plus oxygen goes to iron three oxide. What's happening in that reaction? 
you were going to see that in everyday life, what would you call this reaction? Oxidizing, which combustion is a type of reaction. We've mentioned this before, right? Somebody asked why metals don't burn. And he said, well, you just burning is just a specific way of saying oxidizing, right? Yeah, this is, we refer to this from the point of view of the metal as being an oxidation reaction. But the thing is, if the metal, metal's changing charge, right? The metal's going from being neutral to being what? Minus three? Plus three. The oxygen's going from being zero to Minus two. So it turns out you can't have an oxidation. Oxidation we're going to actually define as anytime something loses electrons. It doesn't always mean oxygen's involved. It doesn't always mean that it's a metal involved either. Either we think of the word oxidation as meaning rust, and therefore we think of it meaning metal. But a lot of things can be oxidized. Oxidation just means that you something lost electrons. But if something loses electrons, those electrons have to go somewhere, right? So what else has to happen at the same time? Does anybody remember the term for it? It refers to the charge on the thing gaining electrons. If something's gaining electrons, what's happening to the charge? It's dropping becoming smaller, more negative, or it's being reduced. So the oxygen in this case is being reduced. It's going from a charge of zero to a charge of minus two. The iron is being oxidized. It's going from zero to plus three. So collectively, you have to have both of these things happen at the same time. Otherwise, the reaction doesn't happen. You can't have, you can't get electrons for the oxygen out of nowhere, right? The electrons have to come from somewhere. So you can't have a reduction without an oxidation. And similarly, you can't have an oxidation without a home for the electrons. The electrons are never going to just be flying around on their own, unless we're getting to really, really high energy specific systems. On Earth, you're never going to have free electrons. So collectively, we refer to this as redox reactions. Redox is short for reduction and oxidation. Does anybody know what you call it if you have a you can you can have an oxidation and a reduction happening in two different physical locations. If you're producing the electrons in one place and then they're being used in another place, what has to happen though? They have to move. How do you move electrons? You excite them, good. They have to travel through something like a wire perhaps, or a conductor. If you have a reduction in oxidation happening two different physical locations, what you really have is a battery because you're, move, you're moving electrons from a high energy system to a lower energy system and forcing them to travel through a wire along the way. You say, if you hooked it up to a circuit, say put a light bulb in the middle of that wire, you can generate photons can generate light or you can generate heat if you put a resistor there. That's all a battery really is. It's a redox reaction where your reduction and your oxidation happen in two different places. Sometimes you just have to get very, very clever about how you wire things up to make it work properly. But as at its core, that's all a battery is. All right. Any reaction that's not a redox reaction. There's not really a word for not redox um, other than not a redox reaction. So I kind of came up with one to classify the rest of these reactions. Any reaction 
that doesn't involve transferring electrons. We're going to call them a complexation reaction. Because you're you're changing what's what's attached to what, but you're not changing any of the individual pieces. So you're making a different a complex in chemistry terms means that you've attached things together, but they're not necessarily changing charge. Um, you can think of it a little bit like um, building with Legos. Anytime you can move, you can put together the pieces, rearrange them in different ways without the electrons changing hands, we're gonna call that a complexation reaction. We're gonna have a couple different subcategories for each of these. All right, so our complexation reactions, um, there are more than these. These are the ones we're gonna spend the most time on in this class. There's, And there are subcategories of each of these as well. Um, but these are the most common cases that we're gonna talk about in this class. Uh, first off, so for the complexation reactions, the simplest one to understand is a precipitation reaction. Is that term ringing any bells? What's a precipitation reaction? Forms a solid. You mix two solutions and you make a solid. Usually it's two solutions. You can have a gas, you bubble a gas through a solution and that makes a salt, forms a solid. Um, but it's at its core, the, the simplest way of thinking about it is, let's see if I have the example on the next one. Uh, if you mix two solutions and you produce a solid, that's precipitation. So figuring out if it's a precipitation reaction, simplest thing is when you're starting from two aqueous solutions, you're gonna end with one aqueous solution and one solid. All right, and so all of this, all of this is, all a precipitation reaction is, is we're making a we're making a mixture of ions where some of the ions don't stay dissolved. Not everything dissolves in water, right? Like salt dissolves in water, magnesium sulfate dissolves in water, lots of ionic compounds dissolve in water, but you can make a combination that doesn't from two ionic compounds. So a um, really common one is uh, silver nitrate aqueous <laughs> plus ah uh, not silver plus well let's just do salt and I raised the A and then immediately rewrote it. When you mix these together, both of these make ionic or uh, aqueous solutions, but when they are mixed together, chlor chloride and silver don't dissolve in water. So we made a combination that no longer dissolves. So we get silver chloride as a solid, and then whatever else is left over, NaNO3. All right, so anytime you've got a, um, you start by mixing two aqueous solutions and you make a solid precipitation reaction. And the solid that you make is called the precipitate. Um, they come from the same root as precipitation in terms of meteorology, but it's a different process. When you form precipitation in the upper atmosphere, that's really just a phase change happening. Um, as opposed to a precipitation reaction, but it can a precipitation reaction can look a lot like snow forming because you wind up you take two clear solutions, mix them together, and then you start getting this really really fine white powder or color or different um, colors of powder forming, and those that's going to be the solid, and so it looks kind of like you're making um, you know snow crystals or something like that. All right, somebody else mentioned acid-base reactions. It's been up here for a while, so I'm sure everybody's already been looking at it. But how do you define an acid-base reaction? 
one of the reactants is an acid and then on the product side, it no longer is an acid. That's one way to look at it. You can have acid-base reactions that don't have things we would name as an acid though. So at its core, an acid-base reaction is just, we move the single H plus. There are more, more complicated definitions of acid-base reactions that we'll see um, as you go on, but the simplest way of understanding it is you moved an H plus. Something was an acid when it met what criteria in nomenclature? It had hydrogen, at least one hydrogen ion, sometimes more than one, right? It's basically anytime you had an ionic compound where you had enough H pluses to match the charge, right? Of your anion. Um, so if you have acid as a reactant and then you have the same ion, but missing an H plus as a product, that's a pretty good clue that that was an acid base reaction. Right, so for instance, H2CO3 aqueous, which we would name as what? It'd be hydrogen and carbonate, but we name it as an acid. So carbonate becomes carbonic acid and water. When you mix them together, you get hydronium and hydrogen carbonate. Everybody see how it's the same pieces on both sides? If you take the water and you give it an extra H plus, you get hydronium. If you take the carbonic acid and you subtract an H plus, you get hydrogen carbonate. All we did, it looks like the, the charges on the overall molecules changed, but none of the individual atoms had their charges change. It's carbonate here and it's still carbonate there. It's just got a different number of H pluses attached. It's water here, it's still water, just with an extra H, H plus attached. So anytime you can recognize the same pieces and all you did was move an H plus, that's an acid base reaction. Who remembers what the Lewis dot structure looks like for water? Mickey Mouse, that works. All hydronium is, if you draw the Lewis dot structure for hydronium, it's water. So if you stick an extra H plus on one of these lone pairs and turn it into a bond instead of a lone pair. Hydronium looks like that. All right, and so that's why we, these aren't considered redox reactions is because oxygen still has all the same electrons it started with, right? It just has an extra H plus glommed onto one of its lone pairs. All right, what if we had Hydrogen phosphate and sulfate reacting. Should put aqueous for both of them. And we made phosphate and hydrogen sulfate. Is that an acid base reaction? We didn't start with an acid though, did we? No, we didn't start with an acid, but we can still see all the same pieces. It's phosphate here, it's still phosphate. It's just missing a hydrogen. Sulfate here, and it's still sulfate, it's an extra hydrogen, right? So anytime you can look at, look at a reaction and see that, that's gonna be our, kind of our definition of an acid base reaction. Uh, okay, so for the sake of 
finishing some of the logic here. Um, when we have an acid base reaction, just like with redox reactions, you have to have something being oxidized and then something to accept the electrons to be reduced, right? You can't have a reduction without oxidation and vice versa. Acid base reactions are similar, except now we're talking, instead of talking about moving electrons, we're talking about moving H pluses, which a lot of times we'll just call them a proton because hydrogen atom has how many protons, neutrons, and electrons? If it's a hydrogen atom and it's neutral, one proton, one electron, no neutrons, right? So an H plus ion, a hydrogen ion, is has how many protons, neutrons, and electrons? Still no neutrons, just one proton. So a lot of times when we're talking about reactions, we'll talk about a proton transfer. That doesn't mean we're changing one element to a different element. The moves means we're moving an H plus from one place to another. <laughs> and whatever's donating the H plus, whatever gives up the H plus is gonna be called the acid in that reaction. And whatever is accepting the H plus is going to be Drum roll, please. Yeah, base. You don't really need to drum roll, but I appreciate the enthusiasm. Yeah, so we have acid and a base. You need both of them for this to happen. You never have an acid reaction without a base to accept the H+. So down here, which is the acid and which is the base? Good, which makes by process of elimination. Yeah, sulfate's the base. So you can have an acid that's not named as an acid. We wouldn't name this as an acid, but it can act as an acid by giving it a proton away. All right, so we're splitting hairs a little bit. Um, and this is a case where the nomenclature doesn't really match up with the chemistry. any other vocab words that you can remember when it comes to acids and bases? So if a reaction can happen this way, it can happen that way too, right? Anytime you have a reaction that can happen, that happens one direction, if you change the conditions, you can get the reverse reaction to happen. So in other words, defining reactants and products is somewhat arbitrary. If this reaction happened backwards, what would the acid be? Hydrogen sulfate, right? So whatever gained the H plus, when it goes the other way, that's gonna act as the acid. We call that the conjugate acid. Which, makes phosphate. It's acting as an acid, but if we just saw this with its formula like this, we would just call it hydrogen phosphate. And really, if it was an ionic compound where it, the charge is balanced out, like let's say we had Na2HPO4, That makes the charges all balance out. So now it's an ionic compound. We wouldn't name that as an acid, right? We would name that as sodium hydrogen phosphate. So when hydrogen phosphate doesn't have the Na pluses to balance out the charge, and it still has a charge there, we're still not gonna name it as an acid. We wouldn't call it phosphoric acid because phosphoric acid specifically means it has enough H pluses to balance out all of the charge. Does that make sense? All right, if hydrogen sulfate's the conjugate acid, if we go backward, what does that make phosphate? Conjugate base. 
ways you could make people better. So just for the sake, you have to start by the, defining your system. If we're going to say that these are our reactants, this is what we're starting from, then we're going to leave these as the acid and the base and the conjugate acid and conjugate base would always be written. If I had written it the other way, then everything would just be flipped. And what we'll see is that you wind up with pairs where if hydrogen phosphate acts as an acid, it always makes the same conjugate base, right? Because it doesn't matter what's accepting the H plus, hydrogen phosphate losing a proton turns into phosphate, right? And so sometimes you hear them called conjugate acid base pairs. So like water can act as a base. And when it does, it always makes hydronium. So hydronium and water are a conjugate acid base pair. They're always tied together, no matter what. For this top one, which is the conjugate acid and which is the conjugate base? For the top reaction. If it went backwards, what would be the acid? What would be the base? The H3O plus has to give up the proton, which makes it the acid. The hydrogen carbonate has to accept the proton, has to accept the H plus, which makes it the conjugate base. Right, so because think about it, to turn hydrogen carbonate back into carbonic acid, you have to give it an extra H plus, right? It has to accept the H plus, which makes it the base if the reaction was happening backward. Right. Or you, the other way to think about it is, okay, carbonic acid is my acid. Whatever it turns into is going to be the conjugate base because they're always going to be paired like that. It's a little bit weird to try and keep track of. It's one of those, those odd vocabulary things where you have to pay attention to it until it becomes sort of second nature. Um, but it's... All right, so for acids and bases, all we're looking for to identify them is where you can still see the same pieces before and after, you just moved a single H plus around. And we're just... All right. So for our redox reactions, our redox reactions are basically going to be everything else. And sometimes they're going to be really easy to identify. For instance, if you have metal ions oxidizing or being reduced, their charges are really easy to spot. If you, anytime you can see metals, a metal ions charge changing, that's a dead giveaway. It's a redox reaction of some sort, right? So for instance, if you put sodium metal with zinc ions, you get sodium ions in zinc metal. Something was oxidized and something was reduced, right? What was oxidized in the first example up there? So for the top one. Yes, in our first example, the iron was oxidized, which I know it's perfect to bring that up because that's how I keep one of the ways to keep them straight, oxidized and reduced. Reduced is always talking about the charge. So when the charge is reduced, when the charge decreases, that's how you can spot a reduction. So zinc goes from plus two to zero. So zinc is being reduced. What's that? So then on the flip side, sodium starts as a metal and it ends up with a charge, right? If sodium starts with a metal or with a, as a metal, metals get oxidized, right? When metals become more stable, they lose electrons. 
So sodium to sodium ion is our oxidation. And zinc to zinc ions to zinc metal is our reduction. There's a couple of ways you can remember that too. This is the one that I was first taught. Leo the lion says grr. Lose electrons is oxidation. Gaining electrons is reduction. It's one way to remember that. Um, the other one I've seen is oil rig. Oil rig. Oil rig, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. Oil rig works, Leo the lion says grr. You can just think about what do metals do? Metals oxidize. You can use that to work your way backward to the right definitions. Just a quick way to remember, to remember that. What about if it's something where the charges are not easy to see changing. Your combustion reaction is classified as a redox reaction, but that there are no metals or charges. It's all covalent compounds. So how do we know what's being oxidized and what's being reduced? Not purely a rhetorical question, seeing if anybody's heard any of the, these terms before, seen any of this. So if, if it's something where it's not immediately obvious, if something is changing charge, we use what's called oxidation states, which are kind of like formal charge in that they're not, it's not a real charge, it's a way of approximating something. And so the way oxidation states work is if you have something that's just an element or an ion on its own, its oxidation state is just the charge. So for this first one, sodium starts out with an oxidation state of zero, it ends with an oxidation state of one. At its most basic, that's what oxidation state is, is gonna be charge. Um, if it's a covalent compound or co has covalent bonds, we basically kind of we start and we just kind of assign charges based on what's most electronegative. Whatever's most electronegative, remember electronegative means it's not good at sharing. If something is electronegative, it's good at pulling electrons towards itself. So if something, if you have a, a mixture of carbon and hydrogen and carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen is because it's closer to fluorine, on the periodic table, we would look at that and say, okay, well, we're gonna get, say carbon has as many electrons as it needs to fill its valence. So carbon has four vacancies, right? So when you have CH4, we would say that carbon being more electronegative gets first dibs on all the electrons. And then hydrogen just has to make do with what's left over. And we need the oxidation states to add up to the overall charge on the molecule, similar to formal charge. So basically this is very similar to formal charge, except now we're not saying that they're sharing. Now we're saying whatever's stronger gets all of the electrons. So what's the oxidation state on the hydrogen in this molecule? The charges have to add up to the overall charge of the molecule, which is zero, right? And there's four hydrogens, so each hydrogen's got to be a plus one. And there's four of them. What about with CO2? What's more electronegative, carbon or oxygen? Oxygen. So oxygen gets first dibs at all the electrons. So what's the oxidation state on the oxygen here? I heard it. Minus two. 
and there's two of them. So what's the charge have to be on the carbon? It's gotta be plus four. So carbon went from a minus four to a plus four. Was it oxidized or reduced? Oxidized. Carbon went from minus four to plus four. It lost electrons and oxidation is loss, right? Oil rig, oxidation is loss. Therefore, our carbon got oxidized. So then in our reaction over there, the question is what got reduced? The electrons had to go somewhere. What's the oxidation state on O2? Zero, right? It has to be the same because they're both identical atoms and it has to add up to zero. So there's only one number that you can add to itself that adds up to zero, right? Zero. We already figured out what the oxidation state is over here, didn't we? So oxygen went from zero to minus two, which makes it reduced. There's one piece on this reaction we haven't touched yet though, which is the water. Does that, is that gonna change anything? It does have oxygen in it. We should probably see if the oxygen is the same oxidation state in both of them. So between hydrogen and oxygen, what's more electronegative? Oxygen. Oxygen's almost always gonna be more electronegative unless fluorine's involved, right? So the charge on oxygen is minus two. And that makes the hydrogens each plus one. All right, so it's basically oxidation states is, is treating covalent compounds like they're ionic when it comes to defining what the charge is. But because there's more than one ratio that you can have them, Arranged, you have you're limited by starting with what's most electronegative and going from there. So anytime you can look at your reaction and say something has a different oxidation state on the reactant side and the product side, it's a redox reaction. This is your foolproof way of determining whether it's redox or complexation. It's redox or not redox. You just go to the oxidation states. All right. Um, some, some textbooks have like priority tables to decide what gets to go first or how you're, how you're gonna assign oxidation states. Um, and I used to teach these, which is partly why they're still in the slides. But basically, it always comes down to electronegativity. So I, I've stopped using these tables and just treat everything um, according to electronegativity with one exception. We're still limited by the total number of electrons that we have to work with. So for instance, if we looked at hydrogen peroxide, what's the oxidation state on oxygen? We would normally think it would be minus two, right? Because it's the most electronegative. But if we do that, what's the charge have to be on the hydrogen? plus two to make it balance out, right? Can hydrogen ever actually be a plus two? It only has one electron to lose, right? 
So we don't have enough electrons for oxygen to actually be a minus two. So this is the hard limit to the electronegativity approach is that if you have a case where you don't have enough electrons, something has to give. And usually, we're still going to give oxygen all the electrons we have, but what's the, on the only possible charge that hydrogen could have? Plus one. And there's two of them. So that makes oxygen two times minus one. In other words, oxygen's really, really not very stable when it's a peroxide. Because oxygen, oxygen's not even stable when it's neutral, when it's O2. And give it one extra electron, get it that much closer to being a full valence, and then make it stop. It's really, really reactive. Um, in fact, if you shine, it's, it's reactive enough that all it takes is visible light. If you shine visible light on hydrogen peroxide, you can actually get it to split. You can break the oxygen-oxygen bond and get it to split into two molecules that are not polyatomic ions. They're called free radicals. A free radical, which the same... Same thing you've heard of in nutrition things or ads and marketing. Free radicals became like a, a big marketing fad a few years ago. Free radicals are really bad for you because they're unpaired electrons. And unpaired electrons are exceptionally unstable. They'll just go in and find something that they can steal an electron from. So incidentally, free radicals, similar to this one, are what cause the hole in the ozone layer because they cause these chain reactions where they steal one electron, but then that leaves some other molecule with an odd number of electrons. Mm -hmm. So it goes on, steals one electron from something else and so on and so forth. And you get this chain reaction that only really stops when you happen to have these two free radicals by chance run into each other and turn back into hydrogen peroxide. But anyway, that's neither here nor there at this point. We have lots of ways that we can practice this. There's lots of different compounds out there. And it's kind of interesting and ties back into our talking about orbitals and electron configurations. When you start looking at what are stable compounds. So formal charge is one way to tell if we have a good Lewis dot structure, right? Oxidation state's also another good way to see if something's going to be relatively stable. Because Ox having oxidation state, it's not really like it's gaining or losing all of its electrons. It's not like a true ion, but it does give a good idea. It should match up to something that has a relatively stable electron configuration. So for instance, we looked at PCL3. Phosphorus trichloride. We're going to assign oxidation states What's more electronegative, chlorine or phosphorus? Chlorine. chlorine. So how many electrons does chlorine need to gain to be stable? Just one. So chlorine is going to have a minus one oxidation state. So what's the oxidation state on phosphorus? Plus three. What would phosphorus's electron configuration look like if it lost three electrons? It would look like magnesium. It would be down to only full or completely empty orbitals, right? It doesn't have an, a partially filled orbital anymore. It's not as good as having a only completely filled or empty energy levels, but it's more stable than having partially filled orbitals. What about PCL5? It's good, yeah. <laughs> But why? What's the oxidation states? Chlorine's still minus one, right? Okay, but now there's five of them. That gives phosphorus an oxidation state of plus five, which would correspond to losing all of its valence electrons and having only full energy levels now, right? 
What about H3 or pH3? I wouldn't usually write it this way because this makes you think you should name it as an acid, but really it's phosphorus trihydride. What's more electronegative between hydrogen or phosphorus? Phosphorus. So what's the charge on the phosphorus going to be? Phosphorus gets to gain as many electrons as it wants. They need to add up to plus three. Hydrogen is kind of a good one to keep in mind for all these because hydrogen can only ever have three possible oxidation states. It can lose an electron and be a plus one. When it's neutral on the periodic table, it's a diatomic gas. What's the oxidation state of, of hydrogen gas? Zero, the same reason that oxygen was zero, right? So if it's with the non-metal, like, like uh, phosphorus, we get plus one on each hydrogen. When it's attached to itself, you get a zero. What's the one other possible oxidation state you could have for hydrogen? Minus one, why? It can, it can gain an electron if you put it with something that's even less electronegative than hydrogen is. So if you had say ALH3, basically the electronegativity of hydrogen is sort of what makes the dividing line between the metals and the non-metals. You put hydrogen with any metal, hydrogen's more electronegative. You put hydrogen with any non-metal, hydrogen is less electronegative. So when you put hydrogen with a metal, now all of a sudden we get minus one charge on hydrogen, which would make aluminum plus three. Hydrogen can only have those three possible numbers, which means if you're not sure what else to do, you can always just say, well, hydrogen has to be either plus one or zero or minus one. And that kind of limits the options for what everything else can be. So for instance, we already did CO2, but look at the bottom row of the, the examples there. What the heck do we do when we have more than one or more than two elements? Start with oxygen, why? It's most electronegative. No matter what else, oxygen is going to get what's coming to it. So we dealt with the most electronegative. What should we do next? Let's do the least electronegative because we don't know what carbon is going to do, but we know that hydrogen is going to lose out. So that means that we have two hydrogens that are each plus one. Which means carbon's got to have an oxidation state of zero. All right, so all this practice basically just to give us the tools to be able to look at a reaction and say, I know what's being oxidized and I know what's being reduced. That's the way we use these oxidation states. We don't, they don't really mean that much on their own. Um, if I was talking to another chemist, I might say like something like, oh, the, the phosphorus has got an oxidation state of plus three as a way of talking about how stable it is or unstable it is, but it really only matters in the context that it controls change. The last one, just to illustrate how annoyingly complicated carbon can be. Same approach here, right? But different combinations. 
Oxygen's got to be minus two. Hydrogens are going to be plus one. They're with other non-metals. So hydrogen's always going to be plus one when it's with other when it's with non-metals. But now there's four of them. So we still need them to add up to zero. So the carbon has to be minus two. All right. This really winds up being important when you start getting into biochemistry, because it turns out every time you change carbon's oxidation state by two, that's a pair of electrons, of high energy electrons that you can take away from it, use to make ATP, and eventually winds up making CO2 down the road. So basically carbon in biochemical systems starts with negative oxidation states, and then gradually the, those electron pairs just get chopped off, turned into ATP, and at the end you're left with just carbon, carbon dioxide. Right, so all these individual steps wind up being important. All right, so let's do an example where we actually have to figure out what's happening here. What's being oxidized and what's being reduced, if anything? So anytime you can turn, you can pull apart one of your products or reactants and say, I know these are this is an ionic compound, you don't need to go through the whole process because you can say sodium hydroxide is a sodium ion and a hydroxide ion, right? So what's the charge on the sodium on the right hand side? On the right hand side? Oh, my bad. On the right hand side, on the product side. Plus one. So sodium went from zero to plus one. Which that makes it a A slash an oxidation. And water. So then over here, we also have a hydroxide ion. Is anything else different about doing oxidation states for polyatomics? No, except that now you need your oxidation states to add up to the charge on the polyatomic instead of adding up to zero. It's the same process. And H2. Have it. So what's being oxidized, what's being reduced? Or we already did oxidized. What's the oxidation state of the hydrogen, the oxygen, and water? We've already done it once, but we can walk through the same logic. Oxygen gets what's theirs first, and then hydrogen gets the leftovers. What about in the hydroxide? Oxygen's what? Minus two. So the oxygen, did the oxygen change? It started with a minus two. The only oxygen we have on the products is still a minus two. So oxygen didn't get reduced or oxidized. This hydrogen didn't get oxidized or reduced, but Elemental hydrogen has a charge of zero. So here's our reduction reaction. All right, so when in doubt, if you don't know what type of reaction it is, if you can't tell right off the bat if it's acid base or if it's precipitation, you think it's going to be a redox reaction, the way to prove it 
is show that you've got oxidation states changing. And with my last 45 seconds, I'm going to really annoy you with the use of the English language again. Um, the oxidizing agent is not the one being oxidized. The oxidizing agent means it's the one doing the oxidizing. Agent means that somebody is doing something, right? So the reducing agent is being oxidized. The oxidizing agent is being reduced. Really annoying that those terms get used all over the place in textbooks. So, and we'll, we'll come back to that. Don't forget polyatomic ion quiz on Wednesday. Be ready for it. Phil. Uh, you said I could retake the lab or make it up from last week, right? Last week's lab. Uh, yeah, let's let's plan on you doing that on this week's lab is going to be on computer so you can do that at home okay. so let's have you do that on thursday okay does that work are you going to be gone on thursday again no. okay tennis is over uh, how'd your season end up we won states hey congratulations yeah. good work good job jay um and then uh, there's the polyatomic ion the whole packet thing and i'd the nomenclature one didn't turn that in, but I was okay. So to get it turned in today, yeah. yeah I awesome. I tried to turn it in. with it with this big of a file. Sometimes that gets tricky, so I'll take this one on paper. Um, and then there was the other assignment that was due last night. That was not getting checked. The so go to the quiz. The the did, stoichiometry. Did, oh, okay. The quiz. There was like another assignment from like last week or something. Okay. Um. So anything that's still outstanding, you can still turn it in late. It's just going to be dinged up. A point or two, depending on how late it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, so for lab four, this is a long time ago. I've just neglected to tell you, but Jay and Philip were my lab partners. Mm -hmm. But I somehow, somehow we mixed up our papers, and I think one of them lost it because I definitely gave one of my papers to them. Okay. Uh, so I don't really know what to turn in, but I was the one who made like the Google Sheets. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we turned in the Google Sheets. So okay. So should I just like turn in the Google Sheets? And so. That's base, right? So usually the way I grade these is being here and doing the lab is worth five out of the 10 points. And then the write up and answering the questions and the pre-lab is the other five points. If you've got the Excel sheet yeah. and you did the, the work and you were here for that, then I can give you all five of those points. Then okay. it's then, you know, depending on how much of the work you have shown on the Excel sheet or how much of the other answers yeah. were, were in there, um, it'll be a sliding scale, but it'll be a, a point or two off. No big deal. Okay. Um, don't don't stress about it too much. Yeah. Okay. I think we did all. Perfect. Yeah. So yeah, why didn't you give me a uh It should denature just about anything. It seems pretty is it just, it's yeah, probably just a phase change that's slowing down how caustic it is, because it should be really caustic to human skin, but if it's not dissolving fast, then it might not wind up causing an issue. So the, the real test would be, hey, uh, hey, are we meeting? Yes, let's ask if you're still down. I'm in yeah. no rush, but. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I'll be over there. I'll go for you. Perfect. Sorry for interrupting. No, no problem. Uh, what have you held your...